earlier this year, we hosted a series uh, of these conversations. The first was about uh, race and privilege, and the second was about sex, gender, and identity. This is where I first learned about Shane Diamond, who's our next speaker. He facilitated that dinner, and I heard people liberated by that experience, both because they were able to ask questions that we might otherwise have shame for asking, but also because they were able to understand themselves in new dimensions because of those things they weren't free to explore previously. So we all have the gift of learning and listening to Shane now. I remember the first time my parents talked to me about sex. I was 10, my parents had been amicably divorced for a number of years, and I was getting something out of my mom's purse at an airport hotel. <laughs> I, pull, <laughs> I pull out a long string of condoms, look at her, and say, what's this weird individually packaged gum? <laughs> my mother tears one open, blows it up so it gets as big as a butternut squash, and tells me, don't ever let a guy tell you he's too big to wear one. With that one sentence, my mother showed me that when talking about sex, there's no need to beat around the bush. Openness and honesty around this topic is no different than ordering dinner. 20 years later, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization that I started here in Maine that talks about consent, sexual assault prevention, and bystander intervention. We've sparked dialogue with students across Maine and around the world. At its core, Speak About It is about teaching people accessible language about consent, pleasure, and bystander intervention, and giving them the confidence to be able to use it. I got into this work because I want people to have good sex. I don't care who it's with, if it's tonight or on your wedding night, if it's with someone you just met or someone you've known before, or someone you've just met or known before, what your genders are or were, your sex should be more than just consensual. It should be pleasurable. All of that is to say I'm good at communicating about communication, at least about sex. Do I practice what I preach? You'll have to ask my wife. <laughs> my name is Shane, and I'm a trans guy. I was assigned female at birth, but my gender identity, or how I see myself, and gender expression, or how I want you to see me, are masculine or male. Hence, I am transgender, changing my gender opposite my sex. My sister asked if this meant I was choosing to pee in the men's room at Grand Central Station. No, ew, I told her. <laughs> it means I'm choosing to hold it. <laughs> if your gender matches your biological sex, it's called cisgender, which means same. We have these terms and definitions to describe things like identity, expression, and sexual attraction, or with whom we want to make out with. But all of these things exist along different spectra, and we place ourselves on different points along each one. There's no formula to figure out the right answer, because there is no right answer, and that's okay. I'm not a trans expert, nor am I a gender expert, but I'm the expert on my own experience and on my own gender. When I went to see my endocrinologist to talk about starting hormones, they asked how long I'd been thinking about transitioning. Well, I said, if I was 10 in 2017, this conversation would look a lot differently because we have more opportunities now than we did then. In 2017, we have advanced gender-affirming surgeries. Parents can hear and believe their four-year-olds who say they're actually a boy, not a girl. And I'm talking about all of this on a stage. But I was 10 in 1997, the same year the Titanic movie and Ellen DeGeneres came out. <laughs> it was headline news that someone could be a celebrity and a lesbian at the same time. <laughs> Our culture was telling me that I was a tomboy, and that was that. Our language is constantly evolving. We have language now to describe things that before we previously couldn't. Things like transgender, gender neutral, cisgender, and bootylicious, which I still can't believe is in the dictionary. <laughs> language are the pieces 
Communication is how we put the puzzle together. Language enables us to engage with people who are different than us. It allows us to empathize. Communication gives us the ability to engage. I wondered if when my smell changed and my voice deepened, you raise an eyebrow, but I stink more now, <laughs> would my dog recognize me? Would I recognize me? Since starting Hormones, it's remarkable to think about the changes that I've experienced. My build has changed. I have muscles where I didn't have muscles before. My four lonely chin hairs have become 17 lonely salt and pepper chin hairs. <laughs> and more importantly, it's changing how I view and interact with the world. I look at my behaviors now, how I process emotions or events, and wonder if I'm fulfilling my own expectations of masculinity, man-spreading, I'm looking at you, <laughs> or if it's because my hormonal chemistry has changed. I'm learning from other dudes how to be a dude. Did you know, for example, that dudes don't wait in line in the actual restroom? They wait outside? Who knew? <laughs> and I'm choosing which cues or behaviors I want to pick up. I've been looking at myself in the mirror for 29 years, and only now is the reflection starting to look familiar. Our sense of self is deeply invested in how we see ourselves and how other people see us. But I don't think I realized until seeing myself as male how much I didn't see myself as fully female. When I came out as trans, one of my college hockey buddies asked me to text him when I got white male privilege. Oh, crap. <laughs> Was this reserved for cis guys, or would I grow into it as my beard grows in and I start passing more easily as a man? Can I avoid being part of the patriarchy by maintaining my identity as a trans guy? And if I can, do I want to? With this new privilege, how could I use my power for good? I've always walked down the street with a purpose. I don't like stopping to engage with people. I often wear headphones with no music playing so people won't talk to me. <laughs> I've noticed now that I'm walking taller. I'm saying hello to people on the sidewalk or engaging with other dog owners. And people are being friendly in return. Not asking for anything, just being friendly. I said good morning to someone on the street the other day, thought about my buddy's text message, and it hit me. I'd gotten male privilege. I realized why I never spoke to anyone on the street before and why it felt so comfortable now. As a female presenting person, once you open up an opportunity for dialogue with someone, they have an invitation to continue talking to you, and you no longer have control over the conversation. Saying good morning to someone, even as a butch homo, was an invitation and I lost control. Now, with my bigger build and sharper, furrier face, <laughs> I have the privilege to start this conversation without the fear of that space being taken away from me. Do men take up space because they're taught to, or because women are taught not to? Or is it all based on our own individual hormonal cocktails? Of course, we could get into the nature versus nurture debate, but what happens when you change your nature? Masculinity expert Andrew Smiler describes a study of how young children communicate. Little girls tend to use affiliative language to promote harmony, focus on the well-being of those involved, and their communication tends to be more collaborative. It's conflict resolution through placating and negotiating. Little boys, on the other hand, tend to be more adversarial, focusing on the well-being of themselves and their conflict resolution tends to be more controlling. What is the problem, and how can I fix it? Smiler describes a situation where an affiliative communicator, in this case, a cis straight woman, might not want to have sex with someone, but she's taught not to, say, not to hurt someone's feelings. So she might say, oh, I don't want to have sex with you in this car. The more assertive communicator, in this example, a cis straight man, will hear a problem that needs to be fixed. Okay, let's go to my parents' house. <laughs> well, what if your mom catches us? It's okay, she's not home. In this example, we're looking at how a, an affiliative, goal-oriented communicator clashes with someone who's more harmony, how can we all get what we want type of communication. But this overlay can apply to any and all situations because fundamentally, people communicate differently. Whether it's based on gender expectations, socialization, 
hormones, or any combination thereof. Communication is the basis for conflict resolution in this example, but can also apply to sexual interactions. How can two people have pleasurable sexual experiences if what we're saying and what we hear are sometimes two different things? I've learned this is called a gender transition, not a change, because it implies that it takes time. I finally feel like myself. I finally feel like I'm communicating in a way that makes sense to me. I'm seeing the world through a new lens, and my communication feels more comfortable in ways that it didn't feel comfortable before. Have you seen uh, The Matrix? You know, they just like upload how to do kung fu. I feel like I've been uploaded how to speak boy, but it's in conflict. <laughs> You're all picturing the movie. <laughs> but it's in conflict with the software that was already there. Now I feel settled. I finally feel like I'm communicating in a way that makes sense. It's like having a drawer full of loose keys and finally finding the one that fits the communication lock. For me, it meant recognizing that my cocktail needed remixing. But it's also about feeling settled in my skin. If you're already settled in your skin, if you're already comfortable, if there is such a thing as a perfect hormonal cocktail, how are you communicating? You don't have to transition to learn this. How is what you're saying being heard? And likewise, what you're hearing being said? We talk about this all the time in our consent education programs, but if you aren't sure, check in, follow up, get clarification. Finding language that works for each of us, whether it's about our own gender identity or presentation, if it's about hooking up with someone, if we're asking somebody for something or being able to hear no. Informed, conscientious communication is central to our well-being and by proxy to our sexual well-being. I don't care who you are or who you're having sexy times with. I just want it to be pleasurable. So go ahead, speak about it. Thank you. Thank you.